before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this program and what else we have coming up in the next couple of months here on Seminary Ridge. Uh, we started these programs back in the time of the first shutdown as a way to yeah, keep engaged with our friends and supporters across the country. And we have found that people love it so much that we have just kind of kept it up, uh, even as things have, have begun to open up. Uh, it's, we've had some really great speakers who have joined us, and uh, it's been a lot of fun to, to keep engaged. And we encourage participation. We encourage people to ask questions and engage with us and, and the speaker throughout, throughout these programs. Next month on April, Cody, remind me, I think it's April 21st. Is that what we said? Uh, we, uh, April 22nd. Yeah. We had originally said that it was April 15th, uh, but uh, as Scott knows, that is Good Friday. So our next History Happy Hour, instead of being on the fourth, the third Friday of the month, it's actually going to be on the fourth Friday of the month on April 22nd. We're going to do our annual Zoom History Happy Hour Gettysburg Trivia, hosted by Cody and myself. And if you joined us last year, you know that we it's a lot of fun and you get to uh, compete for some really great prizes. The top prize, the number one prize, and maybe this will make you not want to win, is a sunset cupola tour with me and Cody. So, you know, that might encourage you, that might discourage you, but we hope that you'll join us and keep looking for information on that as we move uh, through into the next month. In May, we're gonna start up again with our walking tours. And we're gonna do walking tours here on Seminary Ridge, part of our Sunset at the Seminary program, May, June, July, and August. So we're gonna take a little break from the virtual stuff and invite people to come and join us here on Seminary Ridge as the sun is setting and learn about the people who lived and fought and uh, learned here on the Ridge. It's a really great opportunity to again, get out and engage with some friends. So with that being said, I am going to introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. Stephen Longenecker, uh, Professor Emeritus at Bridgewater College down in Virginia. Uh, he is the author of the 2014 book, Gettysburg Religion, uh, which Scott has handy. Mine, as I said earlier, is uh, on my coffee table at home because I have been reading it and I have been using it for grad papers. So it's at home right now and I forgot to bring it today. Uh, but it's a, it's a great read um, using the history of, of religion in Gettysburg to look at the community and look at uh, the issues of, of refinement and, uh, and diversity. So I, I highly recommend it. And this evening, uh, Stephen is gonna talk about some, uh, the, what theology can teach us. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. And thank you very much for joining us. Okay, well, thank you uh, for that uh, very nice introduction. Uh, and uh, double thank you for the nice words about my book. Uh, it's nice to be here. It's an honor and it's humbling to have uh, such a large and uh, such a, a wonderful looking uh, audience. Thank you, okay. We study history for many reasons. It's fun, we're curious, but history also has utility. The past helps us understand the present. Is America today close to a civil war? A look at the 1850s provides a more informed answer that question. And today, uh, unfortunately, everybody is looking at 1939. And uh, let me add that maybe we should look at 1914 as well um, to avoid global catastrophe. Another of history's uses is the understanding of life, of basic human behavior. All of the tendencies, quirks, and idiosyncrasies of human behavior, love, hate, courage, cowardice, honor, dishonesty, greed, it's all there in the past. And therefore my assigned topic, theology in history, helps us to better understand life as does all of history. Specifically, this presentation discusses 
free examples of theology during the Civil War era. One of these examples illustrates basic human behavior. One teaches a complicated lesson about the larger society and about race. And another, the third, illuminates the past, perhaps in a more general way, again about race, but in a simple fundamental concept. Um, the third example is about diversity and the pursuit of equality. The third example is about one of the patches in the American quilt. And uh, the last two examples are from Gettysburg. Theology was vital to the Civil War era. Mark Knoll, the greatest living scholar of American religious history and whose work informs part of this presentation, argues that the cultural conflict that created the Civil War also constituted a crisis for theology. Civil War was a theological crisis. Historian James McPherson has written that Civil War armies were arguably the most religious in American history. During this era, approximately 40% of the population were evangelicals. As historian Perry Miller remarked, the Civil War was fought by children of the revival. The largest circulating per periodical was the Methodist Christian Advocate. The largest organization was the federal government. Number two, the second largest organization in the United States was the Methodist Church. There were twice as many preachers in the United States as soldiers in the United States Army when the war began. There were 35 church buildings for every bank building. Religious organizations operated almost all of the institutions of higher education. And so without a doubt, religion lay at the core of American life. This national religious experience borrowed one of its core assumptions from the Enlightenment. Truth is simple. That was an underlying uh, framework. It does not take higher education, special training, or special insight to understand truth. And from this came the notion that every common person can understand and interpret the Bible. There's no greater authority than the individual. Consequently, both sides in the slavery debate had a strong dose of simplicity in their argument. Abolitionists assumed that their cause was just and pro-slavery theologians countered that it was just as obvious that the Bible did not support abolition. Each side could say that it was easy to recognize the truth in their argument. From the pro-slavery side, much of this simplicity, much of their simplicity revolved around literalism, a focus on easy to understand meanings in various Bible verses. This was the prevailing form of biblical interpretation in North America at that time. Specifically, the pro-slavery Bible argument was that slavery existed in the Old Testament. All those patriarchs had slaves. Doesn't seem to be anything wrong with that. In the New Testament, Paul told a runaway slave to go back to his, um, to his master. A couple of times in the New Testament, it says, slaves, obey your masters. Romans 13 verse 1 says to uh, obey the authorities. And Jesus never criticized slavery. Slavery was present in, in the time and place in which Jesus lived 
and yet he never said a single word against it. So the pro-slavery argument was heavily based on literalism and uh, a basic, easy to understand interpretation of the Bible. In contrast, according to the rules of the time, it was harder to attack slavery from a biblical standpoint. Anti-slavery Protestants struggled to make their argument. An appeal to basic human rights worked in Britain, but not in the United States, where it, appealed, where it appeared as an attack on the Bible. Uh, an appeal to basic human rights came across as an alternate, unchristian source of authority. Generally, anti-slavery Protestants relied on a nuanced and more analytical, analytical use of scripture. But this was not common wisdom applied by common people to biblical interpretation. For example, one popular argument cited Exodus 21, 16, which made it a crime to steal a man, a crime to steal a man. This sounds like kidnapping, and you take it another step, uh, this sounds like slavery. So that was a popular anti-slavery argument, but I think we have to admit it's not quite literal. Another common anti-slavery interpretation was that slavery was counter to the overall spirit of the Bible without quoting specific verses. It just seemed like slavery was counter to, um, to the tone, to the overall teaching of the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach people. The Bible doesn't command people to do things that are basically wrong. And while this may be uh, very persuasive to modern ears, that was a pretty tough sell in uh, antebellum America. Most American Protestants thought that this kind of generalized, um, nuanced interpretation of the Bible was a threat, a threat to the faith. This might require special learning or expertise, and it appears this overall uh, spirit of the thing interpretation appears to lessen the importance of individual verses, like slaves obey your masters. Nuance is usually a tough sell to public opinion. It seems undemocratic, and uh, I still think nuance is a tough sell to public opinion, even in our time. In this atmosphere, then, of a religious-centric society at war with itself, theology is highly instructive. In fact, theology is crucial to the understanding of America during this period. I have three case studies of Civil War era theology that provide insights into the period. On October 26, 1875, Presbyterian preacher Moses Drury Hogue, Drury Hogue proclaimed that Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson was pure because of his faith. The occasion was the dedication of a statue of Jackson in Richmond, Virginia. This was the first large ceremony for a Confederate monument, and a crowd of almost 50,000 gathered for a massive parade, the largest in Richmond's history, and the unveiling of the statue. The late October season created a warm day, but swirling dead leaves added poignancy, as did fate as did faded Confederate flags mingled with new brightly colored stars and stripes. The parade stepped off at 11 a.m. and 90 minutes later arrived at the state capitol building. A Methodist bishop gave the invocation and Hogue delivered the keynote address. Hogue, 
a former Confederate chaplain and longtime pastor of Second Presbyterian in Richmond, praised Jackson for assorted qualities, sacred and secular. But midway through the lengthy speech, the popular Presbyterian cleric mentioned Jackson's purity three times. Hogue never quite said that Jackson was perfect, but he described Jackson as the incarnation of heroic qualities, perhaps a reference to another well-known incarnation. And Hogue praised Jackson for becoming more pure, not quite entirely pure, just more pure. Hogue was a Calvinist, and yet he managed to find near purity in Jackson. This was a significant, inconsist significant inconsistency. Hogue took his theology from John Calvin, the great Reformation hero. And Calvin believed that humans had no worth, no merit whatsoever. That kind of rules out uh, anything close to purity. Humans, according to Calvin, were totally and completely soaked with sin. Only God's grace made salvation possible and, and Christ paid the penalty for human sin on the cross. Hogue told an anecdote, not in the speech, but in a sermon. Hogue told an anecdote about a little girl and the emperor Napoleon to illustrate the critical role of grace. A man received the death sentence. The condemned man's daughter, a small child, somehow slid around the, slid past the guard around the palace and then threaded her way through one apartment and hall after another until at last she reached the emperor. She fell down at his feet, pleading, oh, sire, have mercy on my father. Bonaparte replied that the girl's father had committed his offense twice, and he deserved his punishment. Ah, said the little child, it is not justice, it is mercy that I plead for my father. The emperor granted her wish. This was Hogue's, this was Hogue's understanding of mercy, God's grace, and human ability. This was Hogue's theology. If justice determines salvation, none of us had a chance. We needed mercy. And Jackson's near purity doesn't quite fit into that. In truth, Hogue fudged on human dependency on God for salvation. You know, I've just kind of laid out the theory, the, the classic theology. But on the other hand, Hogue also talked about human ability. He still held, perhaps informally, that humans have a role in their own salvation. Faith is a choice. Hogue encouraged individuals to seek Jesus and to sacrifice all in pursuit of Jesus. He cited Revelation 22:17, come and take the water of life freely. And he quoted the hymnist, just as I am, I come. In brief, humans can help themselves get to heaven. Yet as a Calvinist, Hogue also accepted that humans could do nothing to contribute to their own salvation and that only grace made human um, salvation possible. God worked through human hearts. How do humans, why do humans want to be saved? Why do humans want to be, want to seek God? because God plants that desire there. Humans are so low, so inept, they have so little ability 
that even the desire to see God has to be put there by God. Hogue ruled out a broad church that combined Calvinist creed with free will, which is that people choose God. So he, he was unwilling to compromise with Calvinism and uh, kind of a free will choice, come to Jesus type of, um, of theology. And he didn't want free will preachers in the, uh, in the Presbyterian denomination. But in truth, he got pretty close to free will himself by flirting with the contradiction that only God saves, but humans should nevertheless take steps to achieve salvation. In the end, Hogue confessed that God must know how grace and human agency work together, but he did not. You know, in the end, he couldn't, he couldn't really figure it out. So Hogue's theology taught that salvation only comes from God, but that humans take steps to salvation. Give Hogue credit. He knew he was uh, making a contradiction. He admitted it. But his commitment to Calvinism with, car with its corresponding human in inability and his praise of Jackson's purity was another contradiction. And this one slipped past him. Apparently, he stood on the platform and praised Jackson's purity and never really thought that it was a contradiction with uh, innate human inability. The point, the lesson is that all of us uh, contradict ourselves. This is a fundamental human characteristic. We compartmentalize. This is part of life. You know, we all do it. We all hold things that are intellectually um, or perhaps morally inconsistent. Civil War theology has other lessons. For example, from Civil War theology, we learn how difficult race was for that generation. And maybe for all of us, practical theology in Gettysburg illustrates this. Yeah, I was asked to talk about theology. <laughs> so we'll do practical theology. Practical theology basically applies the belief to practices. It's about how people live, how people express um, in their actions, their religious faith. And one of the most interesting struggles with race in Gettysburg was, was with the Dunkers, um, the Marsh Creek congregation. Look, I guess some of you are from Gettysburg. I, I don't know where this audience is from. It's, it's virtual. Um, but surely some of you must be from Gettysburg and uh, probably, uh, um, you know, battlefield um, buffs. So the Marsh Creek is now the Marsh Creek Church of the Brethren. And it's uh, a little north of town. There were members of this congregation uh, who lived on the battlefield the peach farm, a pivotal point of the battle on the second day, was owned by Mary and Joseph Scherfe. They were both dunkers. They're both members of this fellowship. In fact, Joseph Scherfe was a dunker preacher. And for the Marsh Creek dunkers, race was practical theology. Antebellum era dunkers were very literal in their biblical interpretation, but their literalism was different from other groups. They were non resistant, they dressed plainly and practiced nonconformity to the world. They had a distinct form of baptism, they baptized adults, total immersion three times, uh, once for the Father, once for the Son, once for the Holy Ghost. Yeah, they had scripture for all this. 
They had no paid pastors. They also had a distinct celebration of communion. Y'all lied, this is all practical theology too. They had a distinct celebration of communion. It included feet washing, um, a meal, and then the bread and cup. This is a very literal reenactment of the Lord's Supper. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, so they did it. They called this love feast. They also opposed slavery. Another distinctive practice was the holy kiss. A greeting between members um, was used in daily life. This is a kiss on the lips, uh, same sex, accompanied with uh, a handshake. They also greeted new members as they rose out of the uh, baptismal pool, a stream. <laughs> this is all always outside. As, uh, as newly baptized members uh, climbed out of the creek after baptism, they were greeted with a holy kiss. And after, after feet were washed, uh, there was an exchange of the holy kiss. Okay, okay. The question arose about exchanging the holy kiss with African Americans after they were baptized. You know, this is uh, antebellum Civil War era America. How many whites wanted to exchange a same sex kiss with African Americans? Maybe they should just get a handshake. Well, the Dunkers had a yearly meeting. Uh, they gathered, representatives gathered, and uh, created policy. It was very democratic. It was done simply by, by a vote, often by consensus. Yearly meetings said that Black members should be treated like everybody else, including seating and the holy kiss. This is quite stunning in uh, 1845 America. But yearly meetings guidance ran into some resistance in local congregations. They couldn't quite make it stick with local congregations, especially those that had African-American members. So the item came back to yearly meeting a second time. You know, are we sure we wanna do this? Yearly meeting said, okay, we'll leave it to local congregations. Local congregations can make their own decisions but we still recommend the holy kiss for everybody. And those who resisted it were called weak. Yearly meeting counseled its African-American members to be patient with the weak brethren. So yearly meeting held its, uh, held its ground theoretically, but had to yield some uh, pra practically. One of the congregations that resisted, one of the ones that balked was Marsh Creek. Marsh Creek decided not to do the holy kiss, just to do a handshake. But a vocal minority asked for a second vote, which was unprecedented. They never voted twice on anything, um, but they did this time. The majority held. So despite the vote, uh, I think the takeaway is there's a strong minority in the Marsh Creek congregation who wanted to exchange the holy kiss with African Americans. This is, this is rather unprecedented in white um, antebellum or Civil War era um, uh, America. It's hard to think of any other fellowship, any other denomination that comes close to this. this is, it, well, in some ways, this is a, a very distinctive, very unique argument to the Dunkers because um, they're basically the only uh, feet washers. There's a few others, but um, um, yeah, they're kind of the kind of the only ones who did this. So nobody else in the town of Gettysburg was having an argument anywhere close to this. But nobody else in Gettysburg um, ever really thought about even. They never even thought about um, an expression of equality. 
it got anywhere close to this. And so um, the Dunkers and the Holy Kiss, um, it's kind of a comp, it took me a while to explain it. It's a complicated story and it illustrates just how complicated race was in Civil War era America. Instead of complete justice and equality, which would have been fairly simple, at least in theory, antebellum America and Civil War era America entangled themselves in complicated arguments about race that kept enslaved African Americans in absolute misery and free Blacks in subjugation. But another example of theology in Civil War era Gettysburg illustrates a big idea about basic American society, the Black struggle for equality. Another example, another big idea. Gettysburg had an independent African-American congregation. So a minute ago, when I said nobody else in Gettysburg ever thought about equality in those terms, was no other whites thought about equality in those terms. There was an African-American congregation, the Af St. Paul's African um, Methodist Episcopal Zion, AME Zion, African Methodist Episcopal Zions. This fellowship began in 1838 when a group of African Americans acquired a small rundown building from the Methodists. And this little fellowship um, eventually found their denominational home with the AME Zions. Uh, footnote, um, by the way, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, and Frederick Douglass were all AME Zions. The Zions were similar to white Methodists in theology. Uh, their, their road to salvation was an awareness of sin, an acceptance of God's forgiveness, and an entrance into a new life with Jesus. The new life that's being born again, this is, this is religion of the heart, this is evangelicalism, this is born again religion, it's a close relationship with Jesus. Um, this is all choice. This isn't God's choice. It's the polar opposite from predestination. This is uh, the individual making the choice. This gives humans some ability to save themselves. They, they be, humans become aware of their sin. Humans take a step, or, or maybe more, <laughs> humans take a step to uh, draw themselves closer to God. Now, this is really different from uh, Moses' hope. Okay. And it's very similar to white Methodists. Um, AME Zions really theologically were just, they were kind of black Methodists. There was no theological difference between um, the Zions and white and white Methodists. Okay. Um, has some interesting uh, ramifications. It's a little bit different for African Americans though. Um, the predestination of Calvin had no appeal whatsoever to African Americans. Um, the human ability in Wesleyanism offered optimism and hope. The total sinfulness of uh, Calvinism offered only despair. Hey, African Americans were told every day uh, how low they were, how unworthy they were. They didn't need to hear that when they went to church. So total sinfulness had no traction whatsoever in African-American religion. It was much more optimistic. You can choose Jesus. Uh, you can come to Jesus. All you have to do is drink the water of life without, without price. Equality with whites was possible in born again religion. Every person can do it regardless of status. So in the most important thing in life, uh, salvation, 
and a relationship with Jesus, blacks can achieve equality with whites. In fact, blacks can be superior to whites if the black person is converted and the white person is not. Uh, then suddenly uh, the tables were turned and the black person was superior. African-Americans also like judgment that was in Christianity. Um, it's judgment for all, including white elites and slaveholders. And so free will, um, Methodist Wesleyanism was pervasive among African-Americans. <clears throat> Gettysburg AME Zion had 45 adult members. Um, that's a little bit more like a faithful remnant than a fashionable middle-class congregation. Despite their poverty, they maintain a vibrant, and despite their small numbers, they maintain a vibrant functioning congregation. A congregation is more than the minutia of baptisms and fundraisers, but it's an alternative society with its own rules and relationships. And the uh, Zions and Gettysburg did this. Uh, they reconciled marriages. Uh, once a church committee uh, met with a couple, couple, a, a married couple that was having trouble on a Saturday evening. Yeah, that's changed. They met on a Saturday evening and after each spouse spoke, the committee concluded that the wife was largely at fault. But both husband and wife confessed to error and promised to change. The pastor rebuked the couple sharply, but the husband and wife were apologetic and the committee accepted the apology, just agreeing with the pastor. That's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, the lay people had considerable authority and the pastor said one thing, but the lay people said another and that's what helped. Discipline was also possible. You know, this is an alternative community with its own rules and regulations. And so they disciplined. One woman in the congregation called another a yellow bitch, bald faced bitch and a runaway bitch. This indicates really interesting tensions over race and status in the faith community. But mostly uh, the Gettysburg AME Zions look like mainstream Protestantism. It's African-American faith in many ways was simply American. <clears throat> Worship style, however, was maybe a little different. It was a mix of white American and African customs. The dancing and body movements overlapped with African behavior. Lining hymns resembled African call and response. African choral music is just about all a soloist and then the, and then the ensemble um, call and response. Lining hymns was uh, a Protestant custom. Uh, the leader gave out the, uh, the line, <laughs> uh, you know, amazing grace, uh, a greatest sinner am I, and then the congregation would sing it. This was done for uh, congregations that could only afford one hymnal, uh, or maybe for congregations uh, in which only a couple people could read. Uh, in which literacy was a problem. And so Protestants, um, particularly 18th century Protestants did lining and Africans, African-Americans could really relate to that. The evangelical Wesleyan white Methodist emphasis on a close relationship with Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit in a converted person's heart resembled African spirits. This is another example of overlap between uh, white European Christianity and African-American customs. 
African gods were part of the temporal earth. African gods intermingled with humans. And when the Wesleyans, when, when the Methodists said, let Jesus come into your heart, that's kind of an easy cultural step to take. I'm going to walk with Jesus um, resonated with African Americans. That was an easy concept for them to understand. Actually, it's easier, it was easier for African Americans to understand than it was for Calvinists, uh, like the Puritans, uh, or like Moses Hogue. Uh, Calvinists believed that God was distant, um, hard to understand, and judgmental. So walking with Jesus is evangelical, and the African Americans, yeah, that that was easy. Okay. One African American woman from New Jersey was so overwhelmed by God's spirit that she momentarily left the earthly world. Her spirit seemed to ascend up into the clear circle of the sun's disk where she heard God's voice. And she was immensely far above those spreading trees. So blurred boundaries between the spirits and uh, the temporal earth. Another African custom, easy for African-Americans to put into Christianity. And so Gettysburg African-Americans practiced white religion, but adapted with African and African-American folkways. This is, a, this is an African-American variation on a European theme. What comes across more than anything, or probably more than this, is the struggle for independence and respectability, which in religion was generally successful. You know, the Gettysburg Zions, uh, they were up and running. <laughs> they weren't the most prosperous congregation in town, but they were doing it. And uh, that's a significant um, statement. That's a significant step forward for African Americans. And so these three examples of Civil War era theology instruct about bigger points than their immediate settings. They teach about these three examples, teach about basic human behavior. Hogue reveals that even intelligent persons are full of contradiction and compartmentalization. Yeah, even me, <laughs> I probably do that too. They teach, these three examples teach about the larger society in the past, specifically the Dunkers illustrate the messy struggles that whites had with race. And these examples illuminate the larger society in a more uplifting way. The AME Zions, show the struggle of black Americans for equality and their achievement of dignity. Of course, the Zions reveal that freedom and dignity are simple concepts. I mean, that's, you know, the Dunker thing's a little complicated, but the Zions are pretty easy to understand. Sometimes it's not particularly difficult. And the Zions also tell a positive story about African-American persistence under difficult conditions. The African-Americans weren't totally passive in all this. Um, yeah, they did some pretty remarkable things under, under tough circumstances. Finally, we can trust these examples to be helpful because their basic topic, religion, was so vital to America and to the Civil War era. These lessons, these theologies, lay at the core of society, not its fringes. We can trust these examples to instruct because religion was so critical to American life during this period. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you. you know, the only thing I didn't enjoy about this was I couldn't see you. I love <laughs> looking at my audience. And uh, sorry, I couldn't see a thing. <laughs> but uh, I, I know that, and I enjoyed it. Okay.
What can that's, I do for you? That's the that's the worst thing about this is that I know yeah. that when I'm speaking, I love taking you know my cues from the audience and and people shaking their heads, and I know that I'm on the right track, and that's mm -hmm. been tough with with Zoom, but. Um, we're going to have some some time for questions. I invite you to put questions into the chat box or uh, use the hand raise function on uh, on Zoom. I I have a question, and I don't know maybe Scott or Cody have have a few too to just get us started. But um, my question is is back to the the Dunkers, and you said that they they oppose slavery, but I, I wondered if you could elaborate on a little that a little bit of that and and uh, how they you know they came to that conclusion. Um, well, I'll go with the last one first, and I'm not sure how they came to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, it just seems to be uh, firmly felt, yeah, vaguely defined, but firmly felt. The first anti-slavery statement, I think, was in 1782. And they just said it was the slave trade was wrong. Um, they used the word abolition in the 18 teens, you know, when nobody else was <laughs> Almost nobody else was talking about abolition, and they used that word. Um, I think they use. Are they talking about owning it? Somebody else owning another man's soul. They didn't do much uh, elaboration. I mean, they weren't mm -hmm. particularly deep thinkers <laughs> scripturally, um, but it was wrong to own somebody else's soul. And then they doubled down on their anti-slavery. Uh, through the, uh, through the period, <laughs> you know, every so often there was another statement, hey, can we hire slaves? Uh, you know, what happens if, uh, if you inherit a slave who's a child and can't be freed? You know, and they dealt with all those complexities and never really um, abandoned their anti-slavery precepts. Great, thank you. Uh, Scott, do you wanna you see your hand up there? Yeah, yeah, Steve, thanks for that presentation. You make a uh, really compelling case that uh, one must take religion into account uh, in interpreting the Civil War era. I, I would argue that's true of every era, uh, but it's particularly uh, explicit in the Civil War era. And you spoke exclusively tonight uh, from the Protestant experience, uh, that notion of uh, everyone having their own individual uh, right to interpret the Bible. And I'm curious if you could say a word about the Roman Catholic experience. There you're informed by, at least in theory, a common magisterium. And yet even there, we do see Roman Catholics in the North and in the South uh, taking contrary positions on the issue of slavery. Uh, can you say a word about that, please? Uh, Gettysburg had a Catholic parish and uh, they were pretty strong. Um, they believed in salvation through the sacraments. Um, they, in, in fact, my favorite sermon from Gettysburg was a priest who uh, came out of Georgetown, I think, Georgetown, Maryland, and uh, talked about how important it was to take all the sacraments. Um, it's like a ladder climbing you out of hell. Um, <laughs> each rung is a sacrament. And man, you want to step on all the rungs of the ladder. You want all the sacraments. Yeah, it's true. There were Catholics in both the North and the South. Um, Catholic Church uh, didn't say much about slavery because they didn't want to divide um, uh, the fellowship. They knew that, yeah, a, an outspoken statement would, would, divide, would divide the fellowship. Uh, there were conservative elements in Europe uh, around the Vatican that uh, didn't like uh, North American individualism, didn't like Protestant individualism whatsoever. The Catholic uh, Church is very much top down. And uh, they just thought that all this individualism was absolutely horrible. And that uh, maybe Americans desert, this is the most um, conservative element of Catholicism. But, you know, maybe the Americans deserved all this trouble uh, for letting individualism run amok. You know, if they had some hierarchy and some order, they wouldn't be at each other's throats like they were. Thank you. Um, 
Gregory asks, are there any good books or articles that address theology during the Civil War that you can recommend to a, a general audience? And, and one person, um, Phil, put in uh, Civil War as a Theological Crisis by Mark Knoll. Uh, but is there, is there, what, what do you uh, suggest <laughs> past that one? If there's oh, anything geez. past that one. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's the, <laughs> that's the classic. Um, anything else? Well, um, oh, there's a couple, and they all kind of slip my mind at the moment. Um, there's a big anthology by um, Harry Stout. Um, oh, man, I, I forget the other two. Uh, yeah, um, I'm going over to it's my on the shelf. shelf. It's about five feet away from me. Um, are you uh, upon the altar of a nation? Yeah, upon the altar of a nation. Um, uh, oh, my age uh, names. Um, Here's the a, Mark. The Mark yeah, Knoll. That's it. Yeah, there's a guy at Gettysburg. And here's um, the Harry. Who did a really nice book on uh, Civil War, Civil War religion. Um, yeah, I'll think of his name in a minute or two. <laughs> Um, Joe, I see your hand up. Yeah, I had a question. Nice presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about the Dunkers and their relationship to uh, other, the Pennsylvania German farmers. I assume some were Lutheran, some were Brethren, some were Dunkers, some were Amish. I, I was always confused about the you know, the Pennsylvania German farmers that predominated in the Gettysburg area, you know, what was their faith? As oh, it, was, it, was, it was, it was everything. Um, town of Gettysburg itself was an interesting little manufacturing center. Um, but the surrounding area was all farming, as was uh, most of America. Yeah, it's a myth. Uh, a lot of my students thought that the North was all industrial and the South was all rural. Uh, now the North was uh, overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelmingly rural as well. Um, in the Gettysburg area, yeah, it's uh, um, Lutherans, German Reformed, um, Presbyterians, Methodists, uh, yeah, what, AME, what, AME was Zions. It, was it likely that there were Amish and Mennonites in the area, for example? Um, no. Um, uh, no Amish and uh, no Mennonites during the Civil War era. I forget, maybe a couple in, a, in, in the county somewhere, but I don't think there was a Mennonite congregation in Adams County until... But but isn't Dunkers, isn't Dunkers a similar faith? And I'll leave it at that. Yes. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yes. Okay. I also yes. have over there uh, on my shelf Mennonites Amish uh, in, the oh, yeah. civil, in the Civil War. That was another one. Um, Steve and, Knoll. Yeah, there's a name that, that I it, got. Yeah, it's Steve Knoll. Knoll. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, he also has the, the one about foreigners in, um, is that him too? Uh, yes. The one about, yeah. Strangers in the land, or something like that. Yeah. yeah yes. That's. Uh, I don't want to get up again. It's on the other side. But maybe we'll put. The, I'll put together some titles, maybe, um, and we can we can we can send them out to the participants next week. That would that would be okay. Would be easy. Um. Uh. One one last question from Nancy. Uh. Or we could take two more if we had them. But uh, did the Clapman Clapman Group in England that was successful in stopping slavery in England have any effect in the United States? Um, that's a nice question. Um, yes, yes, there was an, um, a healthy interaction, healthy exchange between the American anti-slavery movement and their um, counterparts in the British Isles. People went to England for conferences and, and so forth. Not sure how influential it was in uh, 
changing policy. And of course, white Southerners knew about it too, and it helped them dig in. Any, anything, uh, no time for, yeah, I, uh, a short answer. <laughs> Any... Quick other question. Sorry. Go ahead, Nancy. Yep. Um, where I and I hopped in a little late, so forgive me if this is uh, something you addressed. Where are the dunkers today? Did they die out? Did they morph into another denomination? Where are they today? Okay, well, the Marsh Creek congregation is still there. It's now the Marsh Creek Church of the Brethren. Okay. And uh, I'll out myself. Uh, I'm brethren. <laughs> um, They've split. There's there's a couple of schisms. Uh, there's a huge one in the 1880s. So they've got a big family tree. Um, but yeah, they're still around. Um, here's here's the first book I I um, recommended by Stephen Knoll, Amish Men and Mennonite Amish in the American Civil War, uh, Johns Hopkins University Press, and then by the same author is. Um, and I think it's he at the he's at Elizabethtown College now. I think. Yes. Um, yeah. He, he's in the the um, Anabaptist studies. Uh, he wrote foreigners in their own land, Pennsylvania Germans in the early Republic. Um, so so two two other ones there, um, and then Scott also put in the chat uh, while God was is marching on the religious world of Civil War soldiers by Stephen Woodworth, which I might have over there as well. George um, Rabel did the one on uh, Civil War religion. Right, the uh, God's, God's almost chosen, chosen okay. people. Yeah. Um, well, that, that being said, we're about two minutes from, from uh, 7.30. I would like to once again thank uh, Professor Longnecker for joining us. Um, really uh, fantastic, enlightening, um, thought-provoking topic and and i i learned a lot i was taking some notes as i was sitting here and um a really strong case for for what theology can can teach us about history so uh with that uh we'll we'll see you on uh april 22nd first <laughs> april <laughs> april uh some the, the fourth friday in april uh for for trivia and um we thank you for joining us this evening. We hope to see you up on the ridge. The museum is open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So uh, we're back open and we hope that we can see you up here on the ridge soon. So thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great evening.